Hey, I'm Stephen Mealy, and I'm here with Pastor Tom. And this is Conversations for the Curious, where we dive deeper into the scripture passage we're studying this week on Sunday to get a different perspective, a different set of eyes on the same verses. Uh, this week we're studying Zechariah 9, 19, or 9, 9 through 12. There we go. And, and we're talking about it prophetically um, through Palm Sunday, because this Sunday is Palm Sunday. And I wanted to ask just a big picture question as we roll into this Sunday. What is Palm Sunday? Palm Sunday remembers when Jesus comes into Jerusalem before his death. Uh, so, and this is leading all the way up to the cross. This is the first part of this. Now, if you go through the rest of the books of the Bible uh, in the New Testament, and Paul's not talking about New, our, uh, Palm Sunday, and neither is anybody else, uh, any of the other writers writing the different books after the Gospels. It's only in the Gospels that we hear about Palm Sunday. Mm. It's the recording of what's going on when Jesus comes into the uh, Jerusalem. Yeah, and what kind of reception is he is he greeted with? Because I know oh, right. it is five days after this we commemorate his death on Good Friday and his resurrection on Easter. So, so what kind of reception is he met with? Well, right. You know, the, we're, we're going to look at Zechariah. What Zechariah is a prediction, as we would say, of Palm Sunday. The reaction is just as the old the prediction was. People are going to be shouting. Shouting for joy. The word is Hosanna, which means that he saves, that Jesus is going to save us. And so they're just all excited. Something really big is going to happen. Emotions are going wild. Can I, can I read that real quick? This okay, right. John 12, 13. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. So this, right. is, this is the, the triumphant entrance that he is greeted with by these uh, citizens of this town, of this city. Yeah, I mean, this, the king is coming. You yeah. know, and I, I, as I hear, you know, we're, we're looking at this from the perspective of the people that were yelling out. Uh, but one of the big issues back in those days is to make sure the people are going to be in line with the government. Mm -hmm. And that if you step out of that and you get into... Um, become a threat to the authorities, they're going to go after you. So I'm, and it's not in the scriptures. Uh, well, where are the authorities? Well, they do show up with Pilate and Agrippa, or Herod, not Agrippa. But uh, you see this, but the, the people that are really threatened by it are the authorities of the high priest, mm. of the uh, religious leadership of the Jewish people. Yeah, huh. <clears throat> They're feeling threatened by this person that's coming in that's going to mess up things. So, but there's the, 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 the what do you say, the hoi polloi, the, the, the masses of people there were just thrilled. That we're getting a king. And this is the kind of king we want. Not like what we have now. See, that's where I see the rub. Yeah. But, you know, this was a smooth entrance into the city. Things are going to change here real quick, though. Yeah, so, so it seemed like people saw Jesus entering in they saw his miracles and said, this is our king. Like David, who led Israel in a powerful way during the greatest years of Israel's success and wealth. And he's going to do the same for us politically. We're under uh, uh, occupation by Rome. We're being oppressed by Rome. But soon, we've been promised a Messiah, and we mis they misunderstood the prophecies of the Old Testament to say, He's going to be a king who comes in, kicks out the Romans, does amazing things for us politically, powerfully, you know, and, and he will become an earthly leader. And this is where they're wrong. So what are they missing in this? Well, they're missing. But they're dealing with life from the, their perspective. And the perspective that they deal with life and to make this apropos to us is that we often deal with life from our perspective. We believe we see the problems of life. Those people believe they see the problems of life, yeah. you know, and the problems of life are God gave this land to us, not to them. They need to go. And uh, so the answer is get them out of there. And then you have Jesus coming in and say, voila, there it is. Boy, are we happy now. Get these people out of our country. Let's get it pure again. Just the Israelites. Uh, let's remove these folks. So they're thrilled from their perspective that this guy's going to do this for us, Jesus. And then, of course, what they've seen or what they've heard, the rumor, probably they didn't all see it. Many of them did. What the miracles that Jesus did, 
boy, life is going to get good. Happy days are here again. You said you didn't know that. Did, yeah, <laughs> that before my time. The President Roosevelt song. Well, it was before my time too, but it was very famous in that people, political parties had picked this thing up from mm. years and years until I guess Fleetwood Mac took over with Bill Clinton with <laughs> Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow, you know. Mm. Uh, but this is... You know, it's, it's almost in a sense, you know, if you could go to a political uh, rally, a convention, mm -hmm. and you see people whooping yeah. it up like some Pentecostal, let's let it loose, and we're yeah. thrilled it's going to be over, life is going to be good again, and, uh, you know, that here it's like, a, make Israel great again, and that they're thrilled, you know, we've got a new king in town, and yeah. just... Yeah, and even interestingly, it almost mirrors the return of like a warring king or, or a great general who's been in the battlefield and when he's entering or leaving the city, all the crowds are there, yeah, yeah. But the difference, of course, was that general would have great mighty men behind him, sword, clad in shield, and they would, he would be riding a mighty war horse. But we see in this passage that Jesus is riding a little young donkey. Verse 14, Jesus found a young donkey, donkey and sat upon it. So Jesus yeah. takes just this humble little animal, uh, unassuming, almost maybe embarrassing a little bit. You know, can you imagine, you know, other guys, right. probably a normal person is walking by you on a horse or a donkey or something, or a, uh, a camel, and you got just a, a donkey, right? Jesus is the polar opposite in some sense of what they would expect in their warring king. Right. I mean, it's not worldly power, you know. Where's the horsepower? You know, no, where's the, literally, yeah. <laughs> you know, and... Uh, and, but, you know, Stephen, you're reading that from John. I mean, but it's here in Zechariah, too, because it says in Zechariah, he comes humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, on the fowl of a donkey. Um, and this whole idea of humility. Now, I'm, you know, it makes me think of, you know, Martin Luther King Jr.'s funeral when they had the donkey out there mm. all in his, um, on a wagon, a casket, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that they don't, you know, even the Pope today doesn't, he has the Pope mobile after he was assassinated this was before you were born. Yeah. Or he wasn't assassinated, but right. he was shot. Right. But he, he likes to jump in this little Renault or this little European car, not to make it look all strong and mighty. That God is reaching out to the world from the back door, not from power. We like horsepower. We like military power. Makes us safe. Um, but God is, again, here, God is doing something different in the world. He's, he's not coming into, they're going to get theirs, or some people put up uh, uh, billboards I've heard of. Don't make me come down there, God. You know, like I'm going to whoop people, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's going to be brutal. None of that. We've got a, a God who comes into the world humble like we are. Yeah. And I think this is important too because, and we talked about this a bit before this, there is a human instinct, a very human one in our hearts to, to gravitate towards political messianism, to look for our savior in politics, right? We're, we're called to engage and be a part of this political stuff around us, but that is not where we find our meaning. That's not where we find salvation, most importantly. And it's not where we find the solutions ultimately to these problems in life. We find these in Christ. And, and if we look for a political leader, we're gonna miss him when he rides on on a little donkey and, and says, I'm not here to overthrow the Romans. I'm here to overthrow sin in your heart. Yeah. So you see two parts of this is that, well, in the Zechariah text, you see uh, the war horses being talked about. But Jesus comes in and says, my kingdom is not of this world. Yeah. It's not of a buildup. And it's non-geographical. You know, geographical left with uh, Israel and Judea. Uh, that that was where God's chosen people. Now he's going to open himself up to the whole world, and he's going to do that not by military pot might and making us one. But we as humans, we deal with our problems in terms of law. The mm -hmm. answers are for smash and grab. You know smash and grab. I do. <laughs> smash Never and grab. Did you know smash that. and grab? Well, right. You know, they had smash and grab, I guess, in Sacramento. We're in California the other day, and they were going to go after these people that did this in the mall. The answers are law. Mm -hmm. The answers are enforcement. The answers are strength. Yeah. The, the greatest threats of life, the answers are, well, in, in terms of humans upon humans, is military strength. You know, there's other things that uh, go after us, like health issues and uh, 
we have relationship issues, but we, we look to, hey, here's the rules. You follow the rules, and that's the answer, but the answer for God, from God's perspective is we're not going to fix this. We're not going to fix this. Jesus is going to fix this, and it's not going to come the way the world sees it. It's going to come through this humility, yeah. this love, and where all of this is leading. I think all those people, man, if they had any idea what was ahead of them, you know, but the, the thing is, too, and I've struggled this for years, hmm. these people who are yelling, Hosanna, Hosanna, how many of them were there a week later yelling, crucify, crucify? Probably a lot of them. But that's because they didn't go into this, this new kingdom with the right heart. They didn't have the heart for the new kingdom. They were expecting one thing, and when it was taken away from them, and he wasn't their political messiah, they wanted to kill him. See, right, you, you, you jumped on that right away because, I mean, we're setting this whole discussion up about politics, you know. That's the answer uh, that they were looking for. Yeah. And once they didn't see they were getting that, then it became crucify, crucify. Mm -hmm. There was still some sadness. I don't know. I, I mean, we're speculating. It's fun to speculate. But, uh, you, you know, how many of them were there and how many of them, you know, had changed on a dime where... It's not happening with this guy. And now we want him out of here. Release Barabbas. Yeah. You know, we'll take the criminal. We'll take the one who lies. We'll take the ones who steal. Not the one who's righteous. Not the one who loves. Not the one who teaches us to pray. Uh, he is not the answer. Yeah. Uh, so, but then back when, when you get to Good Friday, they get a choice of one. Which one do you want? Yeah. You know, <laughs> so. Well, and let, let me say this too. You know, in a time in America right now where a lot of people and around the world do not feel satisfied with the way they're being taken care of by their government or by anything, people start to wonder, well, you know what, I really do want something political. Or I, I really feel like this is the solution, something this or that political. I, I want to I give you this little warning, which is um, that under every bit of political strife and under every bit of war and hardship and difficulty in this life is ultimately the sin that caused it. And the sin that led people to not find amicable solutions or to work together, the greed and the selfishness and whatever. And what Jesus is doing is establishing a kingdom on this earth with citizens on this earth who are dealing with the problem of sin in their life. And the solutions to these problems externally in the world ultimately comes from people working internally with the sins that are keeping them from solving these issues. So we ultimately do look forward to this kingdom where there is no, well, no hurt or pain or anything. But while we're sharing this planet Earth, we need to be united with Christ, dealing with the sin in our life, so that we can be part of these earthly solutions. And really, usually political solutions that we're offered, uh, apart from Christ, are going to lead us to more divisiveness, more hurt, more anger. But when we unite to Christ and we find the change that comes to our heart, we can really enact change globally with people around us, everyone around us. Well, yeah, if you can pull that off, the, the problem, the issue is this is work of the Holy Spirit yes. and humans, and um, humans are going after the solutions that they know. They're going after what's always worked for them before. Yeah. Um, they, we look for what we know is tangible, what we can see in front of us, and God is doing something different with us. Yeah, uh, if, if everybody, it's not going to be heaven, I don't know, this is not going to work, but yeah. if everybody came to Christ and repented, you know, I mean, you, you even in our church, we wouldn't have anybody ticked off, they'd all be happy, you know, or people wouldn't do underhanded things, or, you know, we wouldn't disappoint each other, because we'd all be loving each other, you know, where is that world, well, that world's in the kingdom of glory in heaven, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so, uh, but, but it's the love, you know, you put human beings under stress yeah. and then they will act out you know when you get under stress you get a little ticked off at your family or ticked off at your spouse you know you get uh, under stress as a nation you start getting ticked off with other people in there who don't see the same solutions uh, life is complicated life is going to hurt we're not going to fix it but Jesus is coming here to fix something yeah he is he's coming here to fix something yeah more in, in there yeah now I mean people you know, I think about this a lot, well, not a lot, but from time to time, is that governments can only work on those external issues. Yeah. You know, so if we were in the crowd saying, hey, 
Why are you so happy about this guy? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it was the food. He's going to bring food. Yeah. Oh, it was the health care. Oh, yeah, I heard that Ravi's uncle died, and he brought about him, raised him from the dead again. Yeah. And, uh, and then we can see the obvious one, and now it's really going to get fixed. Get these people the heck out of our country. Yeah. They ain't got no right to be here. This is God's country, and it belongs to us and not them. There's the problems. <laughs> we see yeah. problems being fixed. We see, and you mentioned King David, you know. Yeah. You could go back to the way it was, you know. Yeah, yeah in all of this, they're missing the point. But it's amazing that, you know, and I think the book Zechariah that the actual passage this week is from is written like 450 B.C., somewhere around then. It's amazing someone this far before Christ was even born had such a clear picture of the true intent of Christ's kingdom. And, by the way, one very particular aspect about Christ's ministry. And we started reading that. Let me just read that right there. Zechariah 9.9. 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout... Uh, daughter of Jerusalem. He's personifying, he's giving human characteristics to Israel. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation. Interesting. Characteristics of Christ in his ministry. Christ's perfect righteousness, but him also, his goal, bringing salvation to the world. And then it says, gentle and riding on a donkey. What? On a colt, the foal of a donkey. So right. specific. You know, I, I wish we could just press a little button and go back to the crowds, you know, yeah. <laughs> and start, you know, be like pollsters and they, hey, do you, you guys, uh, you know, Zechariah chapter 9? Is that why? Yeah, yeah. And how many of them would say, yeah, yeah, we've seen that. It's the, the prophet who told us that, uh, that we yeah. need to rejoice. I heard it in the synagogues when I was a kid, you know, and this is it. We're watching it live. But still, they have a different perspective. Yeah. They, have a, they, they don't have the perspective of, and then if you said to them, well, do you see that? Well, he's saying that he has salvation and um, to give. And he has righteousness. Well, what does that mean to you? Salvation. He's going to save us. Save us from what? Yeah. <laughs> save us from the Romans. Hey. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. so that's just the different perspective. You know, and how many people want to use Christianity today as, oh, this is all law. Mm -hmm. It's all rules. This is the rules of God. And we got to get everybody in society to believe in the rules of God. You know, and some people are saying, well, behind that is really the desire for power, the desire for power so you can have your own security and you have your own significance. And there's a lot of people I heard that are ticked off, that, that, not as much verbally, but they're ticked off deep inside because the church is not in charge anymore. Yeah. We are losing our credibility and our influence of society, and the way to fight back is <laughs> laws, rules. Yeah. Get people back in. Get our political people in who are going to restore it to the way it was. Mm -hmm. This is not of God. This is of, of another spirit. The, the spirit of God is the one who created me a clean heart, O oh God. Which, keep going on that donkey. Keep following that donkey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and watch where this is all going. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, and then interestingly, we see verse 10. We roll into the nature of this kingdom. And um, unlike, you know, what one might assume is the means by which you establish a kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, which Jesus is establishing, is not one done through violence or, you know, political intrigue or anything that you would expect. It's rather one of peace. Verse 10, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim, the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bows will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. He will proclaim peace. And I don't know, Stephen, let me ask you the question. And where, where, did you, where would you see that peace coming from? Yeah, we were talking about this before. This is not fulfilled on earth yet. I mean, we haven't seen that. But it's something we look forward to in the kingdom of heaven. We look forward to this in eternity, in salvation, um, where, where we will be united together worldwide, every believer, in the new Jerusalem, in heaven. Yeah, I, so now, he, and I appreciate that. We've got Cindy here, too, that, you know, moving it to that uh, second coming of Christ. We see the first, or the first coming of Christ and the, the event coming into Jerusalem that you have here, that he's bringing in a new kingdom, the kingdom of grace. And it's through the kingdom of grace that we receive peace, peace that comes from above. And it's a foretaste of the feast to come. 
and we say brothers and sisters in Christ and uh, that we are connected. We get ticked off at each other still yeah. uh, and we sin against each other. We disappoint each other in the church. Uh, but we are the brothers and sisters of Christ because of what Jesus is going to do with this. And, mm. you know, the more sense of peace that we grab in our life about what happened in Jerusalem, how did Christ, what did he do for us, and how did he uh, transform us through that great event on that cross, we get a sense of peace, and that peace can overflow. So I can like you even more, Steve. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, we could be brothers in Christ, and we are. Yeah. You know, I don't know if I want you to move in with me. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, I mean, but, but there it is. I mean, there is that beginning. And then, so where does all this play out? It plays out in churches. Now, at the same time, yeah. <laughs> ought we say there's no toxic churches and no dysfunctional churches? Yeah. Heck, yeah, there are. You know, people are still messed up, but it does not change. It does not change the reality of what was going on, just not in this event, but what's coming after this event and how God is out to change lives in the kingdom. Yeah. Uh, in the kingdom, bringing people into the kingdom is what he's doing. And that's where things that really would take off. And that is where our hope is. You know, the text speaks of prisoners here and that, you know, we, Jesus talks about, you know, well, being prisoners of sin. You know, we're locked up. We can't stop. And then he just says, hey, man, I'm getting you out. And I'm getting you out through going through all this stuff and for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. And that's what he does at the cross is, is this, this act that brings redemption to humanity by offering himself up for us. Yeah, beautiful. Um, and so, so if I just read the last two, some of this is kind of confusing to me. I'm going to be honest here. Maybe you can help me out with this. Uh, verse 11, as for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will, as you said, free your prisoners from the waterless grave. I will return to your, uh, return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. Yeah, um, and I would take this as the waterless pit. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's where yours are. But the whole idea that we're stuck as humans, yeah. we're stuck. Um, and that we are prisoners. We are prisoners of trying to make our lives work on our terms. Yeah. We're the same way these other people are. We're not there to, you know, if we could go back 2,000, come over here and start smacking people around. Let me tell you the way yeah. that it really is and what you missed in the Old Testament. No, no, none of that. that. That he's going to set people free through his great love. Mm. And his forgiveness. And he's saying, you know, return to the stronghold of your life. You know, where is your mighty fortress? What is it in your life that gives you security? Yeah. What is it in your life where you feel safe? It's incredibly important for this journey of life that we feel secure and safe. That we are loved in Jesus Christ. That we are declared righteous in Jesus Christ. That we don't have to go out and earn a righteousness for yeah. God or above other people. That we have a God who walks with us, even though we see a threatening world. Yeah. And he's saying, live your life from that place. Return to the stronghold, the mighty fortress. Mm. Yeah, a lot of stuff could go wrong. Well, we just had a, a death happen last night of a young man. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's like, hey, you know, we didn't see that one coming. The carpet gets pulled out, you know, your arteries get clogged and your heart stops and you're done. You know, life is threatening. You're going to live in fear or you have a stronghold. Yeah. You have a stronghold. So, um, and just, you know, follow the donkey, man. Yeah, follow the donkey. <laughs> follow the donkey. <laughs> at the end of that is, is this, and I think it's an interesting thing here. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. When I think of Scripture, I hear the word twice. I hear double portion. What I think of is an inheritance, right? Because the firstborn son would be given a double portion of the inheritance. And it reminds me of, of what we're promised in Christ, which is Christ, firstborn of God, you know, so, well, not quite, but you know, the, the son of God, and he's the one whose portion is waiting for him. There's all this language in scripture about this, this son whose inheritance will be shared with, hum with humanity, with those who believe in him. In that same way, we are offered this great blessing, this double portion, this, this inheritance of Christ for all believers who are willing to follow Jesus. Right, yeah, that we have this great inheritance, and it's given to us as a full deal, but you know, you go and you make Pause. You, you take that inheritance of what has been given to you 
And, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm saying one of the great inheritance that we have in the follow the donkey is Jesus Christ who loves us, who brings us grace, and, um, and, and living that reality out. Return to the stronghold, you know. Yeah. The stronghold is not in what I do. It's what has been done for me in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I'm in the kingdom of heaven, you know. Not a political kingdom, no votes, no uh, votes, uh, no... Uh, getting our guy in, but it is in Jesus Christ. I like that, follow the donkey. I think that'll be my mantra for the week. Follow the donkey. Don't look I for, like that. for your solutions in this life because they're not here. They're in Jesus Christ. So, hey, everybody, thanks. If you've hung in there with us, <laughs> wish you were here. I'd love to hear from you, but uh, thanks for being here with us on this Palm Sunday. Yeah. Uh, tell people to go to, to find a church. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, we're in Sonora, California. This is St. Matthew Lutheran Church. If you guys are looking for a body of believers to celebrate Good Friday, Easter, and this week, Palm Sunday with, please join us, visit us. We, we always have open doors. And if you're not in this area, if you're somewhere else around the country, I encourage you, find a body of believers who celebrate these wonderful days of our faith and uh, experience it with them. Thank you for tuning in. And have a great God's week. peace, everybody. God bless.